we now still have the um, panel discussion. So um, all four speakers are up. So if there are questions, please raise them. Otherwise, I, I do have a question to start with, maybe a bit heretic. But um, regarding the initial point made, made by Carol, that uh, we live in this diverse ecosystem of so many tools, and now having heard about uh, so many different types of workflows, each composed of different aspects of, um, of different um, tools that make up these workflows, on the one hand, probably it's great and, and enhances our lives to have this diversity, but do you see a problem with these tools um, in that it becomes difficult to then make a comparison of the outcomes of these wor workflows because you cannot describe the results accurately enough in order to really make an inference? It's a challenge. Um, so it depends at the level you're, you're wanting to uh, describe your workflows. So we've been attempting to harmonize through shared descriptions at least uh, and some steps so that you can see what is actually what are the basic steps that are, are being executed, but also to encapsulate through containers the actual tools that you were using, the versions, this kind of thing, and also to annotate the uh, workflows, I'm talking about our workflows now in, in Elixir, with um, a, um, a shared ontology which we've been developing that describes inputs and outputs and types and so on. So you can go at least to some point to say within a particular domain, can we produce libraries of workflows and can we set up comparisons? And also uh, in, uh, in Elixir, the tools platform has set up a uh, workflow um, workbench in order to benchmark workflows. So in order to be able to say for particular areas, for particular domains, um, so you know, high throughput sequencing and uh, metagenomic assembly and this kind of things, you can do um, some comparisons because you have standard formats and you have um, standard protocols, you have exposed everything that you're doing and you're collecting all the provenance. But here, we're talking about quite radically different things here. Here, you're, you're really, you're kind of, the workflows are actually encoded experimental ideas. They're not high throughput pipelines. And, and that is different. So I think you have to separate in your workflows. Are, you, are your workflows well, kind of well understood but basically uh, well characterized approaches or are they really the kind of early dawnings of research ideas where you're, the describing of them is very difficult to correlate with somebody else's work because you're actually doing innovation in those workflows. That was a very long winded answer to a very simple question, sorry. Okay, well, my take on it is that, you know, we're dealing with a much smaller problem than what uh, Carol's uh, vast ecosystem of, of uh, workflows is. So for, but I think the magic word was said by Carol again, which is that if you have standards, things become far easier. So to the extent that our mo a given model is well-defined, say, in a standard format like SPML, that's immediately accessible to everybody. No matter how you got at it, you can get to it. Um, we have worked, in fact, we worked with some of the Fairdom Hub uh, uh, people to figure out how best to, to specify the experiments that we use in our workflow, the experiment codification. It's, as you say, it's an, at an early stage. There is no current standard for doing this, which does everything. SEDML does some things, other things do other things. So, you know, one has to try out new things, and then in due course, hopefully, when enough people are interested, a standard will emerge. But the format is available, the data, the database, the data are available for anyone who wants to play with them. And that's, I think, at this stage of the game, that's as far as one can go. Could I make a follow-up point? Of course. The word workflow is seriously overloaded. Can I, can I just say that? Because we talked about data pipelines, which are computational pipelines. There's workflow, which is, uh, the, you were talking about the, the whole design, build, test, learn life cycle. Um, there's models and the whole process of, as you were saying, SBML, 
Um, there's there's re other related activities. I do a, I, my last talk was at Combine, which is the standard setting uh, organisation for those. I think it will be useful within the uh, within the community to really crisp up what people mean when they say workflow, because it does actually matter. I think earlier on we had this thing: does does terminology matter? Yes, it does. Good point. Um, well, I absolutely agree. I maybe have one little thing to to add, to, um, which can be at least part of the uh, of a solution, is that uh, when developing workflows or software tools, um, you can always keep in mind there's always already a range of um, of uh, stuff out there which you can use, and it's really helpful to, uh, as far as possible, build new workflows and new software on existing um, uh, tools. And I think this already can help with comparability uh, through um, across these tools. Okay, I think I have my microphone here. Um, okay. Yes, I think we find that um, the biggest obstacle to data sharing outside of projects is not the lack of standards, although that is an important issue, but the lack of organization and structure within the project itself. Mm -hmm. So the biggest hurdle for people to share data is that they feel they, they have to spend an enormous amount of time cleaning it up for publishing. And that's, and, that, and I actually, I, it's kind of like the, the, you know, the sausage making analogy that you don't want to show how the sausage is made. And, and if, if you want to publish something, you feel like you have to clean up the code, you have to, you have to restructure your data so that people can make sense of it because you just have notes and stickies and, and things like that. So, um, so if, if, uh, uh, what we focus on is, is structuring the project w while it's running so neatly that data sharing <laughs> becomes much, much sim simpler. And then, and then you, can, you, you, know, you can hire like, a company like, like ours to, to convert it into, in, into any format that if, if, if your data are organized and follows a model and, 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 and that you know, that you designed but you know <laughs> and, we can, and other people can understand, then, then the process of data sharing converting to other formats becomes, if not automated, and much greater simplified, and that and that's what that's that's what we see as the greatest obstacle, and we and that's that's what prevents people from from sharing. It's just the cost, the effort um, required. Yeah, I would say that uh, you, the way to do this is to spin it around and not think about how do I make my things shareable and how do I make things reproducible, but how do I improve my project project productivity? As soon as you begin to cast it in that term then it becomes uh, much easier mm -hmm. to, un to sell. Um, but also, uh, you begin to respect the fact that there will be a cost, because it does take a cost. You can't just sort of throw a PhD student at it with a notebook anymore. You're going to have to go through a discipline mm -hmm. and use systems. And that, and that, I think, is part of the um, cultural kind of socialization of the community, is to understand if you want to have long-term, you know, downstream benefit, you're going to have to have upstream cost mm -hmm. at some point. Well, for, for a project of any significant size, the, the actual payoff from or organizing and structure within the project will come within the project, not afterwards. So, yeah, it's, exactly. it, so in, in a way, we can... We, 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 when we talk to people, we don't motivate them by sharing data and open yeah. science, but your project will run smoother. If you, if you scale to more than two or three people working together, w once, you, once you organize it, 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 it pays off very quickly. Yeah, exactly. And retention, that's the other thing. The, the retention thing. is the big sell point to uh, PIs. Retention of people or of data? Retention of information when people move. Because in research, people are churning all the time. They're leaving all the time. And uh, my experience is that uh, investigators are more interested. They, they, they get it when they uh, understand the retention issue. Whereas if you try to, do, to explain the sharing issue, then that's much less compelling. So maybe, uh, unless there's a question from the audience, but maybe just related to this point, you had, a, a Dimitri, you had a very interesting Venn diagram in your talk about uh, experimentalists, data scientists, and data engineers. 
And from my perspective, I, I, I would completely agree also what was basically evident in all the talks. It's, it's very difficult for this data uh, management stuff to be done by a lab. So, so do you think this is a model that needs to be incorporated in general in the neuroscience to have these dedicated data engineer positions? And how could we convince basically the people who give us money that this is required? What do the panelists think about this? Is this required for the future or will the tools be good enough at some point that we don't need it? So I could say in Elixir, we say you need data engineers and you need research software engineers. So it isn't just that you need the data engineers and you need some professionalization around data stewardship. Um, you also need professionalization in software engineering, if you're going to have software, en software environments and tools that will be used by more than the person who just built them. Um, I mean, I, I think that um, the points that you made and Carol made uh, are ex actually resonate well with the funding agencies, that if you want data retention, they certainly believe in data reuse. They really like big groups to be able to use each other's uh, results and make something bigger and better. Um, I mean, yes, so to the extent that you can get them to, to buy into the idea, you can hopefully get them to fund a, a position, but unfortunately this may only be for a finite period of the length of the grant, so we still have the longer term problems. Um, uh, yeah, so I think a little bit of everything will happen, so it's kind of, um, as the tools improve, to do the current level of science will require fewer people uh, to, to, but as it's kind of the red queen situation, to stay in the same place you have to, you have. So, so as tools improve, so I think uh, people will be, be, be uh, a data scientist who knows a, a few tools and, and has access to uh, a network that supports that infrastructure that they're using, whatever it is. Um, they can become more efficient. But as they become more efficient, and as we invent new tools for electrophysiology and neuro all kinds of neuro uh, neurophysiology experimental modalities, the complexity of the data becomes, is becoming much more multimodal, much more uh, massive. Um, it, it will require a next level of complexity. And then, and then once we adopt to that, it, it, it will only, so, so it is a little bit of, of everything will happen. So people will get better. So it will not require to, to have, you will not need to do a, a dedicated data engineer, data scientist for the type of project that currently do, but then you'll step up to the next level. <laughs> okay, so, uh, yeah. so well, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe one more point. Um, uh, well, uh, having a data engineer or a data manager, is, of course, is great, but I think it's not uh, at this point uh, very, um, viable for very small labs of up to five people. And uh, before we arrive at the full automatization of, of these issues, um, I think uh, a necessary step uh, is also to, to create further incentives of, um, of uh, postdocs and uh, PhD students to, to invest time to, to write software to, um, to deal with these, with these issues. Um, like as for now, it's very difficult to, uh, to include uh, contributions to software projects into your thesis or in, into, um, into a high impact journal. So uh, the, well, the measure of success uh, should also uh, adapt to these issues. Yes. So in light of the time, um, I think we need to come to a close, although everything was uh, very much in time. The good thing is the workflow we will do now is very linear and very simple. First of all, I'd like to really thank all of our speakers for this wonderful session and the wonderful talks. So please give them a hand.